Good morning and welcome to Lift and Rift Ministries. My name is Patrick Lustig. It's good to have you back this morning as we continue our Bible study in the book of John. And we're in John chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 20 this morning. Uh, 12 through 20. If you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to get started this morning um, and go through this. And we're going to talk about Jesus, the light of the world. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to do this, Lord, thank you for the, the technology and the ability to do this, Lord, I ask that you meet with us here this morning, help bring back to my remembrance the things that I've studied, Lord, help me to say only what you have me to say, help me to hide behind the cross so they only see you. Lord, if anyone watching this video does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray today is the day that they see their need for you, reach out and call for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've been talking about some things here. We uh, Yesterday we went in and we've seen Jesus forgiving the adulterous woman. Um, we've seen him writing whatever he did in the dirt. And the Pharisees who brought this woman um, was trying to trap Jesus. Uh, you know, they said she was caught in the very act. But if she was caught in the act... As the law required, both parties needed to be punished, and they didn't bring the man. They just brought her. So um, they were trying to trap him up and go against his meekness, as he was claiming to be, and forgiving, and things of that nature. And he wrote in the dirt, and, uh, you know, he, he made the comment of... Uh, Whoever's without sin can cast the first stone, and, and individually they started one by one dispersing, leaving only the woman and Jesus there. And obviously, and as we've seen, Jesus forgave her and didn't uh, condemn her and told her to go and sin no more. We see the forgiving nature of Jesus in that. Um, what he does for us, he, he makes that intercession for us. He is willing to forgive us. So as we get into our study this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 8, um, starting in verse 12, and we're going to go through and we're going to uh, read through verse 20 this morning. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet not my record is true, for I know whence I come, and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. Yet, And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written, in your law that the testimony of two men is true i am one that bear witness of myself and the father that sent me beareth witness of me then said they unto him where is thy father jesus answered ye neither know me nor my father if ye had known me you should have known my father also these words spake jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. And we see a bunch of things going on here in this portion of Scripture. Again, they're coming after him. They're trying to trap him and, and get him in some things. So we see we started off in verse 12 with Jesus spake unto them again, or uh, then spake Jesus unto them again. And he said, you know, I'm the light of the world. So the connection of Christ's discourse with the previous incident and the feast. So the Feast of Tabernacles is over now. Uh, the water of, of uh, Siloa was no more poured out by the altar. The golden lights no longer burned in the forecourt of the temple. But like... But just like uh, Jesus is the true well of salvation, offered from an inexhaustible spring of living water. Remember when um, we talked about 
the uh, when he met the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, and he talked about being that that living water that 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 you'll never thirst for again. Um, he is that inexhaustible spring of living water who we will no longer thirst if we drink from that. Um, so also, as the true light he shone with the never dying luster and order that he might lead sinners out of darkness of death and into the light of life. So what power the the perishable earthly light of the tabernacle had um what power you know it, it's perishable that tabernacle and Jesus is claiming he is the light of the world here and the Pharisees want to come against them and say, you know, you're not telling the truth. You're lying here. And Jesus brought back up the law to them since they want to um, focus on the law. The law says whenever two come saying the same thing, that that word be true. And he said, he's bearing witness of himself and his father is. And then they started questioning about who his father was. Uh, so we see some things in this we got the incident i am the light of the world we see that in verse 12 i am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life so when these words were spoken it was early morning it was in the morning i remember jesus prayed at the mount of olives and then taught in the temple in the morning um so it was early morning they had parted last night after a day of commotion and danger, but at daybreak, Jesus was back again in the midst of the people. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. We can picture to ourselves the unfolding of this uh, new morning, the eyes of the people gazing as, uh, you know, in in miraculous uh just awe of him and his knowledge and how he's teaching so we can see this with uh increasing um boldness in his speaking and purity in his speaking the light uh streamed in from the east it uh disclosed the green fields and well-kept vineyards and pleasant groves of the valley uh it lit up the city as it shown about in glorious uh, the the palaces and the, and the gorgeous temple it was revealed uh, all around them as majestic forms from the mountains how it guided everything the light did and beautiful the pinnacles of the temple and touched the hills with gold it aroused the wicked who then as now turned night into day and worked deeds of violence and wrong under cover of night, how it cleansed the earth and lifted the thick veil of mist um, and drove away that darkness. Even the beasts, uh, savage and dangerous, who through the night had been seeking and, and securing their prey, owned its power and retired from the light into the caves and dens of the earth. All this was present to the thought of the people and standing there in the midst of them, Jesus says, this is the emblem of our mission. I am the light of the world. So all that that I just said to you is describing that light that these people seen. You think about it when you get up in the morning and that, that sunlight hits, maybe you're in, in bed um, and your curtains aren't fully closed. And what happens when that sun comes up and it starts hitting? It wakes you up. It wakes you up. Um, it chases darkness away. That's the power of the light. And Jesus is saying that he is the light of the world. So we see Jesus as the light of the world develops further the affirmation in the 
prologue that we talked about when, when Jesus said he was the light of men and that the light shineth in darkness um, back in chapter one, verses four and five. On this basis, Jesus exhorted his hearers to put their trust in the light while they had him with them. So they might become children of light. That's in John chapter 12. Um, we'll get into that when we get there. Uh, but Jesus concluding his testimony is that he came into the world as light so that no one who believes in him should remain in darkness. When we're lost, we're in darkness. Yet according to uh, the evangelist, the verdict is this. Light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Remember, we discussed that back in chapter 3. Verses 13 and 14, we see the Pharisees again um, challenging and challenging Jesus. And in Jesus' response, continue, you know, if we go back to uh, 5, 31 through through. Um, 40, we see what was going on here. 531, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So we see that whole conversation there that he was having with those religious leaders. And he knows the law. Jesus knows the law. He is the law. Because he's the word. So these guys are saying, you know, your testimony is not true. What you're saying is not true. And Jesus says, I'm not bearing witness of just myself. Somebody else is. And you know what the law says. So he sees himself. Jesus's testimony was not his own and just his. And then verse 15, after that, after he's saying, you know, my father too. 15, he says, you judge after the flesh. I judge no man. You think about that verse. Jesus' statement echoes 1 Samuel 16, 7, which in essence says people reject Jesus because he did not come with regal fanfare or he wasn't flashy. Um, but appearances can be deceiving. We, I, I want to look, if we can, real fast at Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3. Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3. Look at what this says. I'm actually going to read verses one, or verse 1, 2, 1, 2, and 3. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor uh, comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised, and we esteemed him not. I'm going to read 4 and 5 as well. Uh, surely he hath bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him. Stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, that, that picture there of Jesus and him coming as the Messiah and what he's going to do. That, that picture of exactly who he is. And Jesus lived out that picture. Lived it out. Now, if these so-called religious leaders, these Pharisees, knew their scriptures like they were supposed to, what were they forgetting about Isaiah 53? Why don't they remember Isaiah 53 and everything that it says there? He's going to be despised, and you can see the picture there and, and who it is. Um, so now... Jews are not allowed to read Isaiah 53. The, the rabbis, the uh, religious Jews, are not allowed to read 
Isaiah 53, because it goes against their teaching that the Messiah hasn't come. That whole picture there of who Jesus is, is in there. So we see that they're looking at the outside. They're not looking at Jesus through the scriptures. They're just looking on his outward appearance. And then Jesus goes on to say, And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. You know, he's, he's saying who he is. And we see five things here. Excuse me, sorry. We see five things here in this, in these statements that the light of the world. There's a great truth which lies underneath the whole verse, the fall of man. The world is in a state of moral and spiritual darkness. Naturally, men know nothing rightly of themselves, God, holiness, or heaven. They need light. Now, there may be people who aren't in the will of God, aren't Christians or aren't followers, and, and people say, well, he's a good man. Well, the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. No one is truly good. They don't have holiness. They may have some morals because God writes that on our hearts. But no one is good or righteous without Christ. We all need that light. Uh, two, the full and bold manner of our Lord's declaration. He proclaims himself to be the light of the world. None can truly say this but one who knew that he was God. No prophet or apostle ever said it. Jesus is the only one who said he is the light of the world. No one else could make that statement. Think about that. Number three, how our Lord says that he is the light of the world. He is not for a few only, but for all of mankind, the light of the world, the world. There are some who who teach, you know, only certain people are going to get saved. He's the light of the world. Jesus came for us all. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Every human being is part of whosoever. That's what that word means. Everyone. Jesus is for everyone. He's not just for a few, but all my, mankind. Like the sun in the sky, the sun, he shines for the benefit of of all, though all, all may not value or use his light. See, there's we have that choice to accept or not accept. But he came like the morning sun to give light to us all. Uh, the man to whom the promise is made, it is to him that follow with me. Uh, to follow a leader, we are blind or ignorant. If we are blind or ignorant or in the dark or out of the way, it requires trust and confidence. Uh, this is just what the Lord Jesus requires of sinners who want to be saved. Let them commit themselves to Christ, and he will lead them safely to heaven. If a man can do nothing for himself, he cannot do better than trust another and follow him. We can't do anything for ourselves in terms of salvation. Who better to trust than the light of the world? Who better to trust than the one who promises he will never leave us and forsake us? Who better to trust than the one who, by very definition, is love? Remember, I've been saying this. God commended or demonstrated his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son. His name is Jesus. Now there's that song we sing. That's one of my favorite songs. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to spare your ears. I'm not a good singer, but God sent his son. His name is Jesus. 
he came for our benefit, for the benefit of the world, so that we can believe on him and have everlasting life. And then number five, the thing promised to him who follows Jesus. What is promised? Deliverance from darkness and possession of light. This is precisely what Christianity brings to a believer. He feels and sees and has a sense of um, possessing something that he hasn't had before. God shines into the heart and gives light. He is called out of darkness and into the marvelous light. You know, we're promised that light to come out of the darkness. We're, we're promised to not be blind anymore. We're promised to have a heavenly home when we pass on from this world. I, I really have a hard time understanding some things here um, with the way humans think, with the way mankind think. And I've had conversations with people about this before. You know, everyone says by following Christ, by being a Christian, I'm missing out on all these things, all this fun in the world. And um, before I came to Christ, I was miserable. I was miserable in my sin. I was miserable with the things I was doing. You know, I spent time in sin doing things and like drinking, for instance, and I would drink. And when I would try to lay down and go to sleep at night, I would always tell myself I'm not drinking anymore. When I would drink so much that I just, I felt horrible. You know, I wasn't drinking anymore. I wasn't going to do this anymore. Kind of vainly praying that I made it through the night and was able to wake up. That's how sick I was. But then I would get up the next day and end up doing the exact same thing. You know, the Bible talks about a fool in his folly returning to the same things over and over again, just like a dog returns to vomit and uh, licks it up or whatever. That's kind of what we are without Christ. We keep doing the same things over and over again. And salvation, like we talked about, is not um, uh, not perfect. Well, I, I preached at Dallas Pike, and I, I preached on this subject, and I talked about um, salvation is not rainbows and lollipops, and, you know, it's not sunshine and and, and uh, just perfectness all the time. You know, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Because we live in a fallen world, there's going to be trials and there's going to be storms. Um, because of personal sin we may have, there's going to be trials and there's going to be storms. And, you know, these things happen. They happen. We live in a fallen world. Um, God's not causing them. Sometimes we're causing them on ourselves, but a lot of them just come because they come. We live in a fallen world, and people tend to forget that, uh, you know, and then the consequences for our own sin. Everything has consequences. There's always consequences. And sometimes it might even be something that we're doing now. You know, you think of a farmer who plants a field. When he plants a car, uh, crop, that crop doesn't grow and come in the very next day. It takes time. And the same with our lives. Sometimes storms we're going through is from sin from a while ago. Um, and that's not God bringing it up before us again. You know, we talked about that, how he doesn't bring back up our sin. But there's consequences for everything. And, you know, salvation... We get saved, and then a crop comes in from before we were saved. It's not going to be as bad as it was. But there's still consequences. I pray that anyone who does not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior will reach out to me or somebody else, and we can discuss this. I can 
we can help, um, you know, through the scriptures, show you what's missing, showing what you need to do. Um, and that's just believing in him. It's not a prayer. It's not a baptism or anything like that. It is faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We all need the light of the world. Our world is dark and dreary. You know, you just turn on the news and you can see everything that's happening. We need Jesus. We need salvation. We need deliverance. And that's what he offers. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we're thankful for the time that you've given us. Lord, thank you for this lesson. Lord, thank you for who you are. Lord, I ask that you go with us throughout the rest of our day. Help us to keep our hearts and minds focused on you. Apply these scriptures to our lives that we can live better for you. Lord, I pray that uh, the one out there or more than one who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, they see their need for you, they desire you, and they come to you. Either through somebody they know who's following you or they can reach out to me, Lord, and I, I would love to help them. But I will be uh, joyful and rejoicing over anyone who accepts you as Lord and Savior, no matter how it happens, whether I help them or somebody else does or or they just read the scriptures and get in and get an understanding. Lord, we know you can you can reveal yourself to people through the scriptures. Lord, I will rejoice because there's uh, rejoicing in the presence of angels over one sinner who repented, as we should be on earth. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. And Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thanks for joining. Um, come back and join us tomorrow morning as we get into more of this John Bible study. Make sure you check out Blessed with Truth Ministries um, and check out my wife's page to see her daily word of the day and other Bible study videos and um, just her, her uh, uplifting and encouraging posts that she posts. Um, you'll be blessed. So check out Blessed with Truth Ministries. Um, make sure to check out our YouTube and our web page, uh, which is posted here on our Facebook page. Um, go on there, give a follow and a like. Thank you guys for joining me, and may you be blessed with truth today.